Good morning. Welcome to Accenture. A couple housekeeping notes before we get started. We are live streaming today and the camera is house center. So please be mindful as you're crossing through the space. Um, if you're sitting on the left side of the room over here, if you need to access the restrooms or get water, coffee, tea, you can access those from this way. If you are sitting on this side of the room and you need to access the restrooms or get water, coffee, tea, you can see Allison and Eva over there. They are waving at you. They will escort you to the restrooms and to whatever you need. Um, so we're going to get the program started and we will see you shortly. Hey, good, good morning, good morning. Whenever we have people back in person, it's always, I always hate being the one that stands between happy conversation and, uh, and everybody, so. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started this morning, if I can. Um, so good morning, everybody. Welcome to Accenture's new home here in New York. My name is Laura Peterson. If we can cut the music as well in the background, please. Um, I have the privilege of being both the Office Managing Director for New York Metro, as well as I lead our Northeast Business and Communications Media and Technology. We're excited to welcome the Center for an Urban Future this morning around an important topic, the role of employers in expanding access to good jobs. Diversity is the, at the core of our values here at Accenture. As recognized, we're very excited by our number one ranking in Diversity Inc.'s top 50 um, employers last night. Um, and that includes for us a diversification of the talent pool. So you'll hear from an impressive group of leaders this morning, including my friend and colleague Stuart Henderson, who will share more about Accenture's commitment to creating new pathways to employment. Um, before we dive into the program, um, for those of you who are in the space here, so th those on streaming will forgive me, but a bit, uh, a, bit, a bit about this amazing space we're in. So this is our North America Innovation Flagship. Um, it's our hub at One Manhattan West, where we work with our people, um, our partners, our community and our clients to ideate, pilot, and scale innovation, driving to the center of technology and human ingenuity. We started the journey um, here before the pandemic, and we're finally able to open our doors uh, late last spring. Nothing ever goes quite as planned. Um, and it's been an amazing opportunity to demonstrate both resilience, but also our commitment to New York City. So this serves as a place we welcome our people back in person um, as we kind of move, move to the next phase. A core purpose is to foster collaboration, create an omni-connected work experience for our teams, uh, make sure that we're doing so with our, our value of truly human in mind, whether that is our inner faith space, uh, whether that is the neurodiversity that we've designed to recognize that people have different needs uh, to be successful, our accessibility lounge, where we look at the adaptive technology resources and tools that all of our people need to show up their best. Um, and then finally, a central focus on the health and wellness of our people and the planet. So we're proud to share this space with you and invite all of you to come back and take a look when we can uh, explore around and show you what we do. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have a strong passion around the topic today, so I want to share one quick story. Um, I had the chance to spend time this week with a young man named Jaqueen. Um, his, he's a native New Yorker. He was uh, living in the Bronx during the pandemic and had graduated from high school. Um, had limited work experience but a large passion for technology. And without a college degree, he was unable to really get the kind of technology job he wanted. He was working in a grocery store, in a deep freezer, 10 to 12 hours a day, five to six days a week, he said negative 20 to negative 30. We were really fortunate that one of our recruiters connected with him on LinkedIn. Um, he had no idea who Accenture was, but he thought it might be better than a freezer. So uh, we, uh, he, he decided to uh, take a chance and we were fortunate to bring him into our apprentice program in 2020. So he is now a full-time employee with us. He is an associate's development engineer 
Um, he has joined our insurance practice, uh, learned a lot of new skills to the cloud. And during our conversation, he kept reinforcing with me how he's been able to grow as a person, grow professionally, grow personally. He wants to work in new technology and XR, VR. He's getting his Google Cloud Developer Certification for my Google friends in the room. Um, and his eyes have been opened to new horizons, new worlds. Um, I'll, I'll keep from going down to Star Trek. Uh, no, no new civilizations. But um, as he expressed gratitude for the opportunity, um, it struck me and I reinforced him how grateful we are that he's spending his time with us and choosing to build his career with us. Um, I asked him what he wanted me to share this morning. And what he did say was he wants everyone to remember no matter where you come from, you can make it and continue to grow. I'm really proud that we have him as a part of our team um, and excited to see where his journey to the cloud goes next. So as we look around and learn from today's program, I'll think of him and the countless others who are in those programs and initiatives and are the faces of what we're going to talk about today. This diversi the diversification of the talent pool um, has faces and real people behind it, and it's so important for us to bring those stories to life. We have the ability to change the trajectory of New Yorkers' lives, to provide opportunities that previously seemed out of reach, uh, to create a workforce that better represents the communities in which we work and live, harnessing that talent, that passion, that potential by removing the barriers to entry that at times as employers we've been a part of creating um, is going to move the needle for both our business and our community in unimaginable ways. It's incredibly exciting to be here this morning and with that excitement I'd like to introduce Jonathan Bowles, the Executive Director for an Urban Future, uh, for the Center for the Urban Future to kick off today's program. Thanks Laura. All right, good morning everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Um, we haven't had too many in-person events and it's just great to see everybody, great to be back in person. I also wanna thank the 350 or so people that signed up to watch this event uh, live on the live stream. So uh, great for all of you to be here as well. Um, I'm Jonathan Bowles, Executive Director of the Center for an Urban Future. If you're not familiar with us, the center is an independent think tank dedicated to creating a stronger and more equitable economy in New York. In recent months, our work has advanced a number of concrete ideas for how city government can help ensure an inclusive recovery from the pandemic. We've written about the need to scale up the city's most effective tech training programs, shown why there is so much potential to expand apprenticeships in high wage industries like finance, tech, and healthcare, called for extending the state's tuition assistance program to cover part-time students, urged city government to boost support for entrepreneurs living in public housing, and made the case for new programs to help the roughly 700,000 adults in the city who have some college credits but no degree to reconnect with CUNY and complete their credential. But it's also clear to us that the public sector can't do it alone, and that employers will also need to step up, especially when it comes to expanding access to the good jobs they are creating. As our research has shown, black New Yorkers make up 22% of the city's workforce, but hold just 7% of the jobs in the securities industry, 7% of the positions in advertising, 8% in publishing, and 9% in the tech sector. The good news is that several employers in New York are taking important steps to diversify their workforces with investments in paid internships, apprenticeships, and on-the-job training programs and by changing their recruitment, hiring, and retention practices. The two companies we are partnering with today, Accenture and Google, are among those leading the way. Initiatives like the New York Job CEO Council also demonstrate that things are moving in the right direction. But at the same time, it's clear that a lot more employers ought to be taking these steps. Today, my colleagues and I at Cuff are publishing a new report that urges more employers to step up with their own career pathway initiatives. And it also calls on city government to make it as easy as possible for employers to launch these initiatives. Our report, which was made possible thanks to a grant from the Gansher Family Foundation, also provides a snapshot of six innovative employer-led initiatives to expand access to good jobs with enormous potential for replication among other companies in New York. I'm so excited about today's event, which is gonna delve further into what is needed. We have an amazing group of speakers to help us sort through these opportunities and tee up solutions. Following our all-star panel, 
we will be joined by New York's outstanding Deputy Mayor for Economic and Workforce Development, Maria Torres Springer. Before we get to the panel, I want to give a very big thank you to Accenture and Google for their support, for making today's event possible, and for all they're doing already to expand access to good jobs in New York. Now, if our panelists can come up to the stage, I want to turn it over to Cuff's incredibly talented editorial and policy director, Eli Dvorkin. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, let's try to try one more time. Good morning, everybody. All right, there we go. Um, so excited to be here with you today. My name is Eli Dvorkin. I have the uh, great pleasure to be uh, moderating today's event, and I'm also the editorial and policy director at Cuff. Let me quickly introduce our amazing panelists, and then we'll just get right into the discussion. And we'll make sure to save time for questions from our, our amazing audience as well. Uh, so first, let me introduce uh, Shanika Hope, um, sitting at the end of the table. Uh, Shanika is director of tech education at Google. She is a former elementary school teacher and principal, and previously led computer science content and research at Amazon, McGraw-Hill Education, and Discovery Education, among many other roles. Uh, Shanika, welcome. Uh, we are also joined today by Juke Su. Uh, Juke is the co-founder and CEO at Pursuit, uh, one of the city's leading technology training organizations. Uh, Pursuit connects high need and high potential adults with opportunities to become professional software developers and leaders in the tech industry. Uh, Juke, welcome. We're also joined today by uh, Judith Spitz. Uh, Judy is the executive director and founder of Breakthrough Tech, um, a national initiative that propels women and underrepresented folks into higher education and careers in tech through curriculum innovation, career access, and community building. And she previously worked at Verizon, where she served as chief information officer. Welcome, Judy. Uh, we're also joined today by Lisette Nieves. And uh, Lisette is the president of the Fund for the City of New York, which works to advance the functioning of government and nonprofits in New York City and beyond. Uh, Lisette is also the co-author of a new book, Working to Learn, Disrupting the Divide Between College and Career Pathways for Young People, which should be on the reading list of every person in this room. Um, we are uh, also very pleased to, uh, to welcome Stuart Henderson uh, today, uh, our, also our host. Uh, Stuart is uh, the U.S. Northeast Market Lead at Accenture and a member of the company's Global Management Committee. Uh, Stuart is also responsible for building and growing the company's business in New York and, and in the region. And uh, we are really pleased to, uh, to be sharing your space today, Stuart. Thank you. So let me begin, uh, Lisa. I want to start with you because you've been doing this work uh, for a little while now. I think it's safe to say um, you've seen it from from all sides. Um, and I think uh, when we first spoke about this, you would agree that you know it's become only more clear in recent months and over the past couple of years that to rebuild a more inclusive economy in New York, uh, we're going to see need to see a lot more uh, from the private sector. Um, you know, there there. Uh, but even as as high school and college graduation rates have risen, uh, new investments in education and training have been made. You know, the city's fastest growing, well-paying industries and occupations, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, still fall far short of reflecting the full diversity of New York City today. So what is the role of the private sector, in your view, um, when it comes to addressing this, these disparities? And how would you like to see corporations and companies here in New York step up to meet this moment? Thank you for asking that question. Um, first, thank you, Accenture, for hosting this beautiful space, by the way. Really appreciate it. I'd say a couple of things. One is that I would say that irrespective of the sector, interest in getting the best talent is a priority, right? And so I would say particularly to the private sector, how are you currently thinking about talent and how can you expand that notion? Because if you truly believe talent is in every zip code, then you need to have a broader sense of your definition of talent. So that's one, right? And when, when you do that, then you allow pathways that you hadn't thought about before to exist. So that's one. The other thing is, we've got to look historically back to companies in the past, let's, let's look at the 70s when there was a big push. There was a huge investment in the employees and companies. Many of them came with high school degrees, right? Thinking of the finance sector in particular. And I always say the company was married to you. And you were moved up and there was this kind of contract between the company and you, right? I think about that, that was my mother's generation where you'd stay at a company for 30 years and then you'd receive certifications and move up. So we don't have to look that far past to realize that there is precedent for this kind of commitment to move you forward, right? And that's out of the need for talent, right? The other thing I would say companies need to think about is we talk so often about what does it mean to only have 
to have folks for new emerging jobs. I actually think the issue is, what are the current jobs where there's enormous turnover? That is the challenge for companies that we can fill with talent, right? Because both can be true, right? We may not have the set for new talent, but what is the pre-existing conditions that make it difficult to meet your particular mission, right? And so I say, first thing, think broader about talent. Two, it is not a pipeline problem. It's a recruitment challenge until you exhaust every recruitment opportunity. And then number three, create pathways, but look at historically what have been pathways that have moved people from entry level to executive level, because we have precedent in that in many of these companies. Thanks, Lisette. I think, um, you know, uh, picking up on that, that last point, and, and, and your framing as well, you know, it's striking to me that uh, on the one hand, you're absolutely right, of course, that there, there is a long history of precedent for some of these investments and changes in thinking. But at the same time, a lot of the employers that I've spoken with, as well as folks on the workforce training side, have said, you know, we want to see a shift toward co-creating a talent pipeline rather than seeing us as the employer as just a consumer of talent. Um, and I'm curious about the role of employers in doing that. And, and maybe Juke could bring you in mm -hmm. on this point because I think there's a, a, a sense out there from some employers of, well, where can I go to find the kind of talent that we're talking about? Folks that are underrepresented in our workforce today, but have the skills and the experiences needed to be able to deliver for my company right away. And, you know, for those employers in tech who partnered with Pursuit, I think most would say it's you guys. You know, you're doing that work right now. You know, the average Pursuit fellow is seeing their earnings more than quadruple after graduation. Um, we're talking about folks that are, you know, coming from high needs backgrounds. So what role do employers play currently in making the pursuit model work? And maybe more importantly, what would you like to see from other employers to be able to partner with you or other organizations in the future to deepen your impact? Yeah, yeah thank, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think, you know, obviously this is a very kind of difficult problem. And I think since part of the construct of our results is around thinking about it as a broader labor market problem. Right, and I know this is a bit wonky possibly, hopefully that's fine for a center of urban uh, future audience, but um, you know, I think, I, I think even thinking about what Pursuit is doing, focus on working class adults, blue collar workers, right? How to think about upskilling into professional jobs and careers. Um, part of the challenge is that it's a multi-sided marketplace um, and that there are structural barriers and challenges among the different sides of the kind of marketplace. So you have the training side, identifying adults, training, which is the supply side, incredibly important, that has to be effective and also work to meet the job readiness requirements of employers. So one, working with employers, obviously, on design that, understanding those needs. However, that's a necessary, that's a supply side of the marketplace. That is a necessary but not sufficient condition of being hired and being employed, which is probably obvious, right? Like, uh, if you don't have a college degree, which two thirds of Americans don't, or 80% of black Americans don't, even if you have all the confidence and skills that, that if you're capable, you can just never get hired because 75% of jobs that pay $60,000 in the US require a college degree. So think about that. For all the individual merit, the skills and training that's needed, um, even if that's true, a lot of people are just excluded. So, so as from the employer level, on the demand side as well, I think, there, there's like a few different steps. I think there's the investments, there's commitments that you're that uh, people are speaking about, but I think it's um it's a multifaceted issue there also. I think there's one, um, what are the requirements obviously um, for for these kind of jobs? So how do we think about removing college careers requirement? But I think the challenge around that is, yeah, the, the challenge around that is around skills-based hiring, and that's very difficult to do, right? So there's a level of understanding that, being able to do that, design the effective hiring process to do that, and then so much of it is also on the job training, both for the companies and for the, um, the participants. So I think it is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very tough challenge. So I think Pursuit, the way we've tackled it is we do training on the, um, uh, on the supply side and then work with companies on the demand side to provide three years of an employer service to both help the companies and also our participants um, through on-the-job training to make sure that that's kind of successful. And, and I think this idea of shifting the time horizon is really valuable. Ultimately, what do all these kind of different stakeholders want? It's that um, people have successful, thriving careers, right? You know, participants want that, companies want that. So if it's not just thinking about as a placement in that kind of transaction of hiring, but about a multi-year progression into um, a career, 
I think that's a more valuable kind of horizon shift for, for everyone. You know, and so for us, we think about it as for three years. That is the commitment. So thinking about the commitment with this marriage contract that you speak of, we call our employer model Pursue Commit because it is about multi-sided commitment to achieving, you know, not just the initial job, but how does someone get promoted? That's how you really know if things are effective or not, right? If you know you have a thriving career. So if we shift it to that kind of time horizon over three years and it's success-based throughout, um, I think that opens up a huge opportunity to think about what this means and what the pathways are. And that's still a relatively short time horizon in the scheme of things, right? Like for, for someone's career over 10, 20, 30 years. So um, I think there's a lot of these shifts that make it um, change the conversation and the kind of investments that's needed. But I think it's both for the participant side and also for the company side. And, and, but ultimately it has to deliver business value. That's really helpful, Juke. I want to return to, I think, all those points. Um, but I want to pick up on something you said a little bit earlier about um, about doing away with or starting to reduce reliance on degree requirements. And it's something that, you know, Shanika, you mentioned when we first spoke about this. Uh, and it's a huge issue here in New York City where, you know, not far from where we are, I mean, in midtown Manhattan, we're talking about over two thirds of working age adults have a college degree or higher. Uh, in, you know, Mott Haven in the Bronx or in East New York, it's 12% um, or lower. So, you know, we've got a huge disparity in New York City when it comes to college degree attainment. And at Cuff, we've written a lot about what we can do to boost graduation rates, especially in our public colleges. Um, but it strikes me that obviously part of the equation here is around maybe reducing that as a, as a, as a barrier to entry. And you mentioned that you see a real opportunity there, that, that there are opportunities to open up more jobs to workers who are skilled through alternate pathways. Um, so how do you see that playing you know, a role in expanding access to good jobs, not just any kind of positions, but, but actually helping to develop pathways that lead to advancement that could be open to folks without those traditional uh, credentials? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think Lizette and Duque really touched on a lot of the the kind of key strategies that we need to think about. Um, starting with the fact that nationally, less than half of U.S. residents um, actually have the college degree. And so then when you think about the work that needs to happen here locally, we recognize, to Duque's point, this is a complex issue that's going to require both private and public sector partnership. And so one of the things that we think about here at Google is how do we leverage the local, local partners who are closest to New York residents, who understand the communities, understand what their needs are, where they are, and then we use that, that partnership and their understanding of the community to inform the types of programs that we, we look to build. Uh, yes, the credential of the, co the four-year degree serves as a proxy to give us a sense of the signals that that the, the candidate may have that readies them or demonstrates readiness for, for the particular role. And that's an important signal, but there are other signals and pathways that we need to explore in partnership with, with public partners and with, the, with uh, pub, other private partners in the public sector to really understand and explore what are some of those other alternative pathways that, that we can leverage that have really best practices like the, the, the work that UK leads uh, with his organization. One of the things that we've done um, here at Google is working with, for example, like libraries that have their, their staples in the community, they understand their residents, communities trust them. And so how do we work with libraries to bring alternative educational pathways like career certificates to residents? So that allows them to accelerate very quickly, gain those, ready, those necessary skills, upskill, and then step into jobs that create 30% increase in, in their, their take home income. So it's really about looking at different partners, working with CUNY and SUNY, for example, that's one of the things that we do, because it's not just end of funnel, right? So readying the adults that have the motivation and the readiness and recognize, look, I, I've got to do something different to move from the freezer to Accenture. It's also looking further down the funnel, working in K-12, for example. So we have partnerships with CUNY and SUNY where we're looking at how do we support pre-service teachers? How do we support in-service teachers so that we can give them practical, curriculum, hands-on learning, so we can expose more students at the, at the beginning of the funnel so that they get that, extra, that exposure to computational thinking, computing, using technology, so that students spark that curiosity. We're also readying them and, and laying the groundwork with some of those technical skills that students will need that readies them for some of these tech jobs and tech adjacent jobs. So that's how we think about this. So it's, you know, we need to reimagine um, how we look at the talent profile for tech roles. And so it's not necessarily getting rid of the college degree, which certainly for middle skill and advanced skill tech jobs, um, that advanced learning, having access to advanced mathematics, 
um, data, data structures, all of that's really important, but we also have to look at it more systemically and look at how are we as industry supporting all of the, the, the entire ecosystem that is important to laying the groundwork and readying talent for jobs of future. And so that's kind of how we think about it, working with libraries, working with public schools, K-12, working with the, the university system to build out other alternative pathways that are readying uh, talent for, for the jobs of the future. That, thank you for that answer, Shaniko. We, we couldn't agree more, I think, at Cuff, at the power of libraries in particular, kind of key social infrastructure in every community with that level of trust, where folks are already every day, but they can help you know, people access pathways, um, build skills and acquire credentials and move towards better jobs. Um, I think at the, at the same time, I'd love to ask a little bit more about what's going on on the employer side. And, and Stuart, I'll turn to you for this. You know, it strikes me that um, very little change is possible without real commitment buy-in at the top level of a company toward these goals. Um, that it has to be more than uh, statements and, and, and even donations, but really, you know, getting towards culture change and, and a business case for why these investments are so needed. And Accenture, I think, is doing a lot of that work. And again, congratulations on, um, on your award last night. Um, but I'd like to ask about what it took to get there, you know, the path to last night uh, and that recognition. And in particular, the idea that, you know, Accenture is, is, is building these initiatives and changes into your overall business strategy. So, so how does Accenture think about expanding access to good jobs within the company as a corporate priority? Um, and what are some of the specific initiatives that you think are having the greatest impact today? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me add my uh, welcome to you all on top of Laura's. We're delighted to have you here in the building. I apologize for the cloud. Um, hopefully hopefully we'll, we'll find a way to organize the weather next time and move the cloud on. Um, I want to start answering your question with a question that I think a lot of the clients and Accenture's leadership spend asking themselves. And the question we ask ourselves is, are we lazy? Are we lazy? And the reason that's an important question is because I think it's really easy to put the word bachelors on every job posting. And the data says that that's what happens. Because in actual fact, there was a Harvard study, they looked at the data and they said, they looked at supervisors of production workers. And 16% of those supervisors hold a college degree. But 67% of the postings for that role require a college degree. So there's a 51% gap there. And I think that's laziness. I think that's probably laziness. And so um, Accenture uh, kind of loves to go the other way you know, when, when the world says go this way. And so rather than taking a kind of perspective of academic inflation, we said, what percentage of our roles here in North America actually require a college degree? And the answer is actually only half, only half. That's a pretty extraordinary number for a place which spends a lot of time fighting for uh, the very best people coming out of the very best schools. It was a big wake up call for all of us. And so back in 2016, we started in Chicago an apprentice program. And the apprentice program is a chance to change the script. It's a place where we pay, take people who don't have four year college degrees. We give them professional roles. We hire them into technical and client facing roles. And it's a learn and earn model. It's a 12 month program. And at the end, they have the opportunity to become part of Accenture full time forever. And we, well, in most cases, that's the, that's the norm. Um, we have to date hired 1200 apprentices, um, 575 just in this last year alone. And we've set the goal for Accenture in FY22, which is our fiscal year 22, which ends at the end of August, to have made 20% of our hires uh, to be uh, in our apprentice program. These people are in security analyst roles. They're in applied artificial intelligence. They're in roles where they're working on digital transformation. And the best bit about this, and I saved it for last because it's important, is over half these apprentices are from ethnic minorities and almost half are female. And so it's not just a source of talent, it's a source of extraordinarily diverse talent. And so for us, I can tell you, and, and the story Laura shared at the start was impactful, there are hundreds of those stories and they are all amazing. And the people that come and work here, I've got a chance to meet them, they are absolutely extraordinary because not only are they working at Accenture, they're also continuing their education. And so some of these people are working harder than some of the very hardest people we have because they are striving to find a way forward and it's a delight to have them here as part of our workforce and see the impact they have on our clients and our teams. Thank you, Stuart. That's, that's really uh, really inspiring. And, and uh, frankly, I think that apprenticeship model is, is incredibly 
uh, has an enormous potential for New York City, where we have had apprenticeships in the building trades for decades, but very few apprenticeship programs, both registered and, and more un, you know, unregistered models, in other industries and fields where high wage jobs are growing quickly. Um, so the idea of an apprenticeship program in professional services is, is a really has a huge potential, I think, for New York. Um, and I'm excited to hear about the growth. Um, let me ask Judy, let me bring you into this conversation as well, because I do really want to push on what more employers need to be doing. I think if you ask a lot of New Yorkers today, there's a perception out there that good jobs are still so hard to come by. The pandemic has only made this more clear. Folks feel like they were stuck in, you know, in, in minimum wage or low wage roles. And frankly, New York City, as expensive as New York is, uh, you need to earn about double the minimum wage to make a family sustaining wage in New York. So, you know, in this pandemic, I think a lot of New Yorkers feel like they've reversed their economic fortunes. And obviously part of what needs to happen is for employers to be able to do more. But I wanna ask about one specific area of, of really enormous need. You know, we, we write a lot about CUNY at the Center for an Urban Future. And it is so striking when you look at the number of CUNY students who ever report having a paid internship in, in their entire college career, it's about 10%, um, you know, in an institution with, you know, a quarter of a million students. So there's a long way to go there. Now, CUNY, I think, would acknowledge there's more that the institution can do, and especially with more resources or support from state and city government, but there's obviously such a need for employers to do more here as well. And at the same time, at Breakthrough Tech, you are piloting or innovating on an, on a, uh, an internship model that is growing and it's not only growing here in New York, but it's been successful enough that you're replicating what's working here in New York across the country. So how did you do it? What's needed from employers to be able to do more? Well, that's thank you very much for that question and happy to talk about um, some of the opportunities for innovation within higher ed and at the intersection really of academia and industry. I just wanna take a minute to do a little bit of a level set on the data with respect to gender in tech. Uh, probably most people in this room are familiar, but I'm always surprised at how surprised people are with the data. Uh, so if you're not aware, the participation of women in uh, uh, the graduating classes of computer science over the last 30 years has gone down dramatically. In 1985, that number was 37% of the graduating class. Today, it's about 18 or 19%. Think about what happened in those 30 years in terms of the whole world moving in terms of the tech industry. Um, what's equally as surprising is that it hit that low in 2006, and it's been essentially flat ever since. So we're doing a whole bunch of things talking about women in tech, and the numbers are not moving much. Now that's a little deceptive because that number is based on the number of men, which is also going up. So another interesting number is of all the women getting undergraduate degrees, what percentage of them are pursuing degrees in tech-related fields? And the answer is about 1%. Think about that, 1%. Barely changed in the last 20-something years. If that 1% could move up to 5%, the number of tech workers in this country would increase by 57% and the gender equity challenge in terms of numbers would essentially go away. So there's a huge opportunity there, right? 58% of the undergraduate population are women and only 1% of them are studying computer science. So I just think it's important that we keep our eye focused on that because it requires intentionality, just like it requires intentionality about uh, focusing on black and uh, Latinx first gen and so on, if you're not intentional about gender, you will end up with the same percentage at the end. So that's where our focus is. We are focused at this intersection between industry and academia, as you made reference. And what we see is a lot of uh, this kind of finger pointing. You see industry saying, you know, we really want to hire more women in tech and we want to hire more diverse candidates. If only the universities would be pumping more of them out, we'd hire them. And then you see academia saying, well, places like CUNY and others, we work with UIC in Chicago, FIU in Miami, George Mason uh, and UMD in DC, saying, guess what? If you keep going to the same universities and recruiting in the same ways and looking for the same thing on the resumes, you're gonna get the same candidates in your hiring pool. Uh, so we're doing a lot of things on the academic side to say, how do we uh, solve that issue from a curriculum perspective? But on the industry side, Here's the data point that opened our eyes with reference to what you were asking about. We 
uh, lined up a bunch of industry players, huge ones like Google and Accenture, but there are, as, as was made reference in the introductory remarks, there are hundreds of uh, other industry players that could lean into this. Uh, and we said, you know, you don't usually hire your interns from CUNY, but you know, why don't you lean into that with us, raise their hands. And then we passed forward the resumes of these incredibly talented young women and 5% of them got through that door into a paid internship, which we know is the single biggest predictor of landing a job when you graduate. And these are people who were leaning in. And when we asked them this, they said, listen, these kids have nothing on their resumes. They don't go to weekend hackathons. Uh, they're not doing unpaid apprenticeships and so on. Why? Well, sure, of course. Those are attributes of the privilege of having the free time to do those kinds of things and the network connections that can do that. They're not attributes of potential. So we created a program um, called a Sprinternship. Think Sprint. It is a three-week micro-internship paid for by companies, just like a summer intern, only it's not over the summer. <clears throat> it's during an academic break in January, in some cities, in May, in others. It's early in a college student's career. Why? Because they're trying to, we're trying to get them a resume credential such that on their own, they can compete for a summer internship when they are juniors and seniors. I can talk to you more about it, but we put them in in cohorts. It's an amazing experience and so on. Uh, we've now had well over 1,300 sprint turns, over 100 companies participate. And the success rate of those students in landing a summer internship on their own, not necessarily at the company where they did their sprint internship, went from about 5% to about 55%. So yes, it's a great number and it's not hard to do. And so I want to make sure I don't leave this room without challenging every company that's represented in this room and every other one you know. If you have the wherewithal to host summer interns, then you have the wherewithal to host one or more groups of sprint turns, and you will uh, send those students off on a trajectory. It's, it's like lighting a match and they are off and running. Once they get that first paid summer internship, our experience, is that the next summer they're getting five, six, seven offers. And these are CUNY students and students who go to student uh, schools like that in other parts of the country. I mean, uh, yeah, Shadika, go ahead, please. I'd just like to make a, a couple of quick comments on to Stuart's point and, and Judy's point, in particular around the apprenticeships and the internships. Um, and, and I personally have helped, to, I've hosted and served as a technical advisor for students through the Breakthrough Tech program. But I think what's really important here, back to what can industry do? What more can we do? It's the, the, the apprenticeships and the internships really gives industry the opportunity to help the private, the public partner through CUNY, SUNY, et cetera, get visibility into what is the hiring bar? What are the kinds of skills and competencies that students need to demonstrate or talent needs to demonstrate to be ready for the career? And so I think that's an important role and responsibility that industry has in terms of providing sufficient signals around what are the kinds of competencies, talents, skills that need to be demonstrated by, by talent. So that's one thing that's critically important. And here at Google, specifically in New York, we too have over, um, over 600 internship interns or apprentices here in New York. Uh, and in particular, we've been working closely with CUNY and SUNY on the apprenticeship work here, here specifically in New York City. I think the other point that I want to call out is back to the fact that this is a system. This is a systems issue, and so going back to K-12 and the role of K-12, one of the things that Google has also been doing is with, specifically with teachers. We've provided externships for teachers to give teachers the opportunity to work alongside of Googlers to understand what do we do every day, what are the kinds of things that are happening every day at, at Google, so that they can take that learning back to their students build that into their curriculum so that their students, again, we're sparking curiosity in the students and giving them visibility to what are these jobs requiring. So that's another thing that we're doing is providing externship opportunities for teachers. We're doing that currently in the Washington DC area. One last point to call out globally. Internationally, Brookings just recently released a report that where they did a case study on, an, on over a dozen um, countries or states. And specifically what's interesting is in France and in um, Australia, um, computer science is required. It's compulsory from K through 10. 
And what's interesting is so 100% of students get access to computer science. They use hands-on learning, they use tink, they do a lot of tinkering. And by 11th grade, where students have to raise their hand to stay in computer science, fascinating, we see the same trends that we see here in the US. So what's interesting is Google is interested, we are paying attention specifically to these two particular use cases to understand what, what's the benefit here in terms of how do we build off of the fact that compulsory education K-10, and they're seeing more students stay in the pathway, raise their hand, and then when you look at the parity play in terms of how many girls are electing to stay on post-secondary side, you're seeing more parity uh, that's tr that is persisting on into the workforce. So there's something interesting to pay attention to about these early seed planning on, on the K-12 side of, uh, of, of the spectrum, the educational pathway. And I'll go to Duque. Uh, I, I just wanted to point out something about the larger ecosystem that you pointed out, which I think is even the talented students that have the credentials are not getting hired when they're from the public universities. And so this becomes, so when you say, what can employers do? One is look at your hiring practices. What are your interviewing? I know Google went through this. They changed some of their interviewing practices. How do they think about that? I know Accenture went through that, right? You know, you don't receive the recognition that Accenture received last night without all, these, with all of these tiny decisions that make a huge impact on a pipeline, right? So one is, what are the barriers? So I first asked that question. What's the kind of equity audit you would do first, right? And that includes everything from, I've seen a difference in tech companies saying, from instead of having a full group of just white males sitting on a panel like this, bringing in someone and saying, coding on that wall right now. That's your last interview stage. Could you imagine that kind of intimidation? That, ha that has changed in quite a few of these tech companies. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And we know those shifts had to happen, right? And so that's one example, but we know that there are many of those examples, right? Because I think this question of what are the pipelines, and then I'm gonna also higher ed on it too. We know too in higher ed, there's a reason why Young women did not persist as well, too. When some colleges did the audit themselves, too, they said, who has the least ranking in the department with the least investment in the beginning of the experience that's not there for the long term, that's who has been the gateway for future thinkers in this area. And so even the science departments had to rethink, what does this look like? What are we doing in doing that? So, so when we think about the larger ecosystem, and then the last thing I wanna say on the college degree, because I do think this is a fascinating one, is we can't ignore the college for all. People have digested that. They have digested that. And I'm always interested about the number, not so much how many completed their degree, but how many started their degree, and also how many students are working at CUNY. The majority are working, right, right? right and more than half black americans have some college credits right so when we say these numbers what has happened is we had a predatory environment particularly for black women that has created a wealth gap that is unconscionable so when you say how do we get folks there we have a whole group of students who are undercredited over in debt and outside that which is part of the dysfunctioning of a lot of economic systems there. So I just want to say that because we can't ignore that too when we're saying what are the levers we have to move. There's the employer, there's a for-profit institution, and then there's a public institution. We all have responsibility. I'd love to return to this, and I think in you know, the very near future, moving into really what policymakers can do to support this work. Um, but Juke, I did want to ask you something else about the, the private sector, and that's you know, we are living through an incredible boom of tech startups in New York City right now. It obviously didn't start yesterday, but we now have you know 10,000 plus startups in New York. Um, many of them are growing into mid-sized and larger companies. This is where so much of the job growth is actually happening in New York. Um, but at the same time, it's definitely striking and understandable that very, very few of those companies, I think, feel like they have the bandwidth, the internal know-how, uh, or the time, frankly, to be able to participate in some of these, in some of these systems. Um, and you know, I wanted to ask you about this because at the same time, you know, most jobs in New York City are in small businesses, whether it's a tech startup or you know, a business on the corner. Um, but many of the employers that we're seeing that are taking some of these steps are really big companies, you know, global and, and multinational firms. So um, your experience you know, and understanding that there's so many uh, clear barriers for smaller companies, smaller tech companies to do some of these things with uh, their, their growth metrics and their, you know, their, their time constraints, 
But what do you see as, as, as a role for the city's smaller and mid-sized tech firms in particular to be able to step up and do more? Is there an opportunity there? And what would you like to see them do? Short answer is ab absolutely. Ultimately, it has to be a business case for, for any of this. But um, And I, I was going to talk about that. But before getting to that, I want to go back a little bit, if you don't mind, on, on this idea of uh, internships and apprenticeships. And I think um, I think it's really incredible, um, you know, what... what um, what has been kind of done for these kind of CUNY students in creating these kind of uh, internships. I guess the point I want to kind of separate though is also around like, I know we're throwing around a lot of these terms and um, I think there's different utility for different audiences and what is happening. And I think we should be conscious of that. So for example, if a CUNY student is already skilled and capable and they need a short internship for a signal and kind of experience on the resume, I think that's like one thing about solving one kind of issue and opportunity. If it is for a, um, if it is for someone else that may not have the, all the skills or, or something else, that's an apprenticeship. Like, what are these? What are we trying to do? And not all these things are kind of created equal. Um, and, and I guess part of that is that, like, I think like there's this focus on apprenticeships right now, which I think is. I think the positive direction, but this is probably unpopular from my perspective. But um, I think that oftentimes these terms and most apprenticeships aren't like very meaningful, um, and they're more optics than actual any substance. And I think that's a dangerous path to go down as well. So. Um, yeah, 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 definitely. Cause, cause so, so, and I, I think it's all positive. I think it's, it's like, I think we should applaud the directions, but we should be specific about what each of these programs are actually trying to do. Well, one thing is, I'm conscious of like, I think apprenticeship models in theory are good, right? And getting more people into the door. But I think what's best also is that this is not a second system by which people are entering a company where there are contractor jobs, not full-time jobs, low-paid jobs without benefits, there aren't real jobs, and it's just more, and I think it's it's more important where, you know, if they're apprenticeships, they should be out the front door, not the back door, and, and I think a lot of these issues are around, you know, what, what kind of, um, also, what does that say about talent if we're creating other alternative systems, which are not part of the traditional kind of career path. And I think so, again, not all apprenticeships or internships are created equal, but if it's an alternate path that is stuck and it's not a real job, I don't think we should necessarily applaud that either. <laughs> so so just, um, you know, it's like greenwashing. A lot of this stuff is bullshit, you know? So, so, um, so, so, so in terms of shifting that, that doesn't mean it's a bad idea. I just want to be careful about like what this terminology means and it's probably controversial and unpopular. But going, going back to this idea, also professional services, what's done, right? If you are hiring someone into investment banking or management consulting, there's no expectation, no one, anyone knows in the first two or three years, management consulting or investment banking, right? But it's this, and that's essentially an apprenticeship program, but you're not calling it something different. You're just shifting the time horizon by which someone is there and learning and doing stuff on the job for two or three years. So I think that's much more meaningful versus a label that is meaningless and not a real job and not an actual career path. So that's just one thing, unfortunately, I want to kind of point out because it's like, you know, we can all feel good about this. And that's important. And that's still better than nothing. But I think it doesn't create meaningful careers if it doesn't do that. Um, that's, that's one thing. But OK, so going back to the other idea around what can employers do, it is still so a can I just yeah, jump in yeah, for yeah, one yeah, second? I'll yeah, give yeah. it back to you. I uh, agree 100% yeah. that we don't want to make up sort of fake make-believe pathways that make us feel good but don't lead, uh, lead to long-term careers. Uh, I think part of the way to do that is to look at the standard um, institutions through which uh, these students and, and future talent are trying to move, like large, diverse public universities getting in the front door and asking ourselves, what are the barriers that these students are hitting and getting rid of those barriers as opposed to creating side doors and so forth. So as an example, uh, most of the CUNY students do not declare their majors in their freshman or until midway through their sophomore year. That is a huge opportunity pool 
to open these students' eyes to the fact that they are capable of having uh, degrees in um, tech-related disciplines. And I want to go back to your point. This is an economic justice issue to leave half of the available talent pool women sitting on the sidelines of where all the money is is not only an issue in terms of diversity and better outcomes, it's also an economic justice issue. So there are programs that we're working on, but I, I won't go through them, but that go right into the student as they're entering their freshman year that industry has to participate in to open their eyes to the possibility that they too can join this tech industry and then they're on the regular path. If you look at the introduction to computer science classes, these things are still primarily being taught the way organic chemistry is taught, to weed out anybody but the diehards uh, from moving forward. It should be exactly the opposite, upside down, to encourage the non-traditional techies that they too can play here. Just think about the calculus requirement. I doubt in most of these uh, boot camps and skill-based programs that they are requiring the students to take calculus. That is a huge barrier to entry for a lot of people that can have perfectly great careers going through the standard pathway. So I think we have to look at all of the barriers from the time they enter the normal pathway till they get their foot in the door of a, the front door of, uh, of these great jobs. Hello, there we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you on that because I think there is this hidden assumption that the one door is the meritocracy, that that's where all the merit has. I actually think it's a both end. There has to be multiple doors into a company. I actually think that the one door myth is problematic. And when I had to build apprenticeships with company, the first thing they said to me was, well, if I create, this is 16 years ago, not this discussion, it's a different discussion today. 16 years ago on Wall Street was, well, Lizette, what am I going to do for all my college grads that are here? Ooh, that's a back door. Does that mean that, I, that they are not being, right? All, all the no's, right? And I said to them, I said, your pathway is not solving your pain point of turnover in this area. So you need to expand that. And I just say that because I think this notion of one pathway, there has to be multiple doors and multiple ways of thinking about that. And then, guess what? 26 different firms said, yes, I'll sign on. Because you're right, I am not solving it through this one pathway, and my assumption of meritocracy, meritocracy through one pathway is not enough. I, I, I totally agree with the multiple pathways. Don't, don't get me wrong. Multiple get, doors. Multiple then. doors, multiple doors. I'm just saying, once you enter the door, I want to make sure it's equal. You're and not the same, okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and also, because oftentimes some of those doors they're not actual jobs and they're they're not um and and so it's it's more I, I i very much believe in the multiple pathways multiple doors but we should be conscious of what door you're entering and what that means for someone and also just this terminology what does it make one feel if you're apprentice and 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 sometimes what does that feel at a company versus you're part of this path it may be a different door of entering but you should be you know, you, you should allow your talent to flourish in the same way as part of the same kind of system and career path once you're there. And I think I just want to be kind of be conscious of that. But but um, but it's not. If know. I could, let, let me let me bring Stuart back in, yeah. in part because you're running an, a, a really an experiment in, in this exact idea right now about, you know, hiring 20 percent of your new roles through apprenticeship programs right now. So I'm curious, you know, uh, you have this now on the ground experience started in Chicago, brought it to New York. Um, and, and how that's actually working and how that fits in with your, your broader strategy. But I also want to take it back to what employers can be doing. And I think there's no question that this is one of those concrete things. I love the specificity of it the same way that the sprinternship model or the idea of, you know, having externships for your, for to bring folk teachers in to your company. You know, these are concrete achievable things. And so Stuart, I'm wondering if you were going to talk to other company leaders about what are the concrete specific things that you could be doing right now to help expand pathways to the good jobs that you're creating you know every every day every week um what are some of those other things that stand at the top of the list and what's that advice that you would give to other folks in, in leadership roles thanks and, and thank first of all okay thanks for getting the conversation going <laughs> you, you you know it, uh, being a little bit controversial we got we got some we got some good stuff going so for, congratulations first of all so 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 
so I, I love the I love the challenge. Nobody wants a spray on a spray on apprenticeship program. I, I don't think there's anybody in this room who thinks spray on apprenticeship is a good idea. And so, first of all, um, there's an easy way to do this, and this is this forms part of the advice that we give clients. Um, number one, this has to be sponsored at the very senior levels of a company. And for us, that's Jimmy Etheridge, our North America CEO. It's also Julie Sweet, our global CEO. You cannot delegate the responsibility for having a an apprentice program that is not spray on or you've got greenwash. So, so, so number one is you have to sponsor it at the most very most senior levels. The second thing is it's actually pretty easy to start in the sense that there is a playbook that we've built. That playbook um, is available publicly. It's not something you have to buy from Accenture. You don't have to buy any Accenture consulting whilst we would love that. You don't have to, you can just go and download it. That playbook exists and it really gets to that point, which is they have to be real jobs, market-based wages. There has to be a pathway into full-time employment. There has to be a way that people will, will not have the kind of uh, negativity of, well, you're an apprentice, not a, not a uh, graduate. And we've, we, you know, if we, 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 you know, that playbook is, is very real and people are using it. It's also um, something which is sets a standard. The business roundtable is it, it uses it. So, so number one is sponsor it. Number two is use the playbook. The playbook is actually is well developed. A lot of good employers involved in it, and a lot of successful apprentice programs where people are getting into full time jobs and they and they're paid market based wages. They're getting the training they need. And the last is you have to do this now before it's done to you. Let me explain that. It's proxy season right now. So if you're in a public, if you're a publicly traded company, it's proxy season. And proxy season uh, means that that, that uh, shareholders get to vote on stuff. And um, the number of uh, ESG or inclusion and diversity level uh, votes that are increasing have increased. So last year was about 400 and something. This year it's in the five, in the, somewhere in the high 500s. And and right now, Amazon, v uh, shareholders of Amazon will vote based on a motion put forward by the New York State Pension Fund to audit their uh, racial equality policies. And so shareholders have a vote. Now, we, we at Accenture, we've got this concept of value 360. So we, we typically would engage with clients primarily on delivery of a financial outcome for them. Uh, we, we help them grow. We help them save money. We help them, you know, whatever it might be, but it's typically being financial. Our whole uh, approach to helping clients now is uh, much broader than that. It would be around their ESG goals, sustainability goals, is around improving their inclusion and diversity because stakeholder capitalism is now something that, that both boards and shareholders are demanding of CEOs. And so it's not enough to have great financial results. You have to be a stronger and more robust part of society and where you operate. And if you're a New York CEO and you have not paid attention to what's happening, the likelihood of a shareholder vote on, on some of these topics is Increase, increasingly commonly going to be the, the case. And so, so from my perspective is, number one, you've got to sponsor it. Number two, the playbook is there. Go use it. Number three, do it before the, your shareholders do it to you. I, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I agree um, largely. I think the, the executive sponsorship is super important. Um, so not to, like, challenge this notion too much, because obviously love is censure, <laughs> a lot of respect to the host, uh, being here also, but thinking about this idea, it's, um, and, and, and I want to get back to like, it's not just all on the players, it's actually so much on the training, what's effective and trust there, but, but, and thinking about that, but let's say this, this idea of this apprenticeship right now, could you share like, what's the, what's the wage of the apprenticeship? And I, I think it's for well, you, let me, right? Jake, let me jump in for a second. Cause I mean, <laughs> this is, I mean, first of all, this is a fascinating conversation and we could have an entire, we have had an entire cut form just focused on apprenticeships in fact, and we'll do it again. But, but let me actually, I want to add, I want to inject a couple of other ideas in here. Cause one of them I think speaks directly to what you're getting at, which is around retention and advancement, you know? So part of the challenge here, when you talk about whatever the pathway into the firm is, what are the outcomes when you get there, you know? And in New York City, we see that there's some really alarming data. I mean, for instance, the average uh, black New Yorker working in banking earns about $53,000 a year. The average white New Yorker in, in, in banking, $123,000 a year. Now, this is in the same industry, and there's many reasons for this, but I think at least part of it comes to what can companies do to promote retention and advancement within their own firms. That's one thing I'd love to touch on, but we have a little bit of time. What? I think it's the same question. Well, you, right? wait, 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 yeah. let me, because I want to make sure we get, get to everybody around the table about this. But let me just throw one other idea out there, because I, I want to, this may spark other thoughts, which is you know, we spent a lot of the conversation today so far talking about expanding pathways to good jobs for New Yorkers of 
color who are you know, strikingly and, and concerningly underrepresented in these areas. But there's so many other dimensions to the diversity of New York where there's significant underrepresentation. We just published a report at Cuff about the challenges that New Yorkers with disabilities face in seeking out and gaining gainful employment in New York. And the unemployment rate for New Yorkers with disabilities right now is over 17%. You know, it's more than double the, the citywide average. Um, and that goes as well for older New Yorkers, many of whom have had increasing challenges, you know, reconnecting with work or staying employed, all of which I think is connected to issues around retention and advancement. And uh, Shadik, I'm looking at you because you mentioned this when we spoke earlier, but I, I open this up to everybody. The big question here is what more can companies, should be they be doing around retaining and advancing folks who are currently underrepresented? We've talked a lot about getting in to the job, but what, do you have, what can we do to help folks stay in advance? Yeah. <laughs> and a little louder for the people in the back. Yeah. That'll wake you up. I think we've all been with the, with the pause on the mic, so I apologize for blowing your eardrums. Um, I think it really gets back to the, the, the notion of the executive sponsorship. Um, part of the advancement of underrepresented individuals is having a seat and a voice at the table. And so what research tells us consistently is the importance of sponsorship. And so lending that, that, that capital, that existing privileged leaders have in these various spaces is critically important. I think the other piece is one of the aspects that we know that works really, really well is also the component of shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder mentorship. Um, it's critically important that these in, that underrepresented talent that, that are new into spaces uh, may not have the benefit of having privilege and access uh, on their journey. Having that coach, a trusted resource where they can ask questions, uh, get that development and the support that they need. And so some of the things that we've done at Google is having, we have intentional programs that provide that mentorship, that also provide that sponsorship for, for talent so that they can have a safe place to have voice, but also to have someone standing with them and advocating for them, telling them to take risks, uh, giving them visibility to other opportunities to grow and advance them. The other thing is constantly reskilling and, and staying current on your skill set, having a, an, a learn and be curious mindset to new, new, new technologies, that's something else that's really important towards that advance, um, in advancing and, and being a leader in, in, in tech or tech adjacent um, kinds of companies. So those are kind of the big three, three opportunities there, the sponsorship, the mentorship, and the reskilling. So I'll just jump in. Um, first of all, again, focused on gender. Uh, about 50% of the women in tech leave their jobs within the first uh, three to five years, and they are not going home and not working. They're simply going into other industries. So this is a pervasive problem that has to be dealt with. Uh, uh, the place of employment, I agree with all of your ideas, especially near peer mentoring. Um, just if we move just a little bit further back into the students as they're graduating college, the whole area of what is traditionally called career services is an area that uh, really, I think almost everybody I know in career services agrees, hasn't been innovated in many decades. Um, and it is ripe for innovation if we think of it more as career readiness. Uh, it is the intersection it's where industry and academia really cross paths and the career traditional career services like job fairs and things like that that's all happening around the career services organizations especially at these large public universities we have to conquer the challenge of leaning into it even though it can be complex and so on uh, that is where the, t the diverse talent i want to add to your diversity first gen uh, socioeconomically challenged uh, students who have the same kinds of problems that black and Latinx um, and, and women have. So I think there's an opportunity to get industry to lean into a new model of career readiness um, services that will get the students, uh, these diverse students, more prepared to be successful when they enter the workplace. Um, it's incredibly important because they're not getting that training at home or through any of their networks. Thing, I mean, uh, thinking about not just uh, the role of employers, which is what we focused on obviously today, but the role of city and state government in helping to incentivize, push, uh, cajole, encourage, whatever verb you want to choose. How does, how does the role of city and state government play into, not just in general, in building stronger talent pipelines, investing in CUNY, all these things that we know are part of the solution, but specifically in moving the needle among employers? What would you like to see the mayor of New York City do? We've got folks here from, from the mayor's office, from the, from the administration, uh, from across city and state government tuning in online. What would you like to see government do to help push or pull 
uh, more employers to take some of these key steps? I love that question. <laughs> you know, I, I think there's a couple of things, and it was mentioned on the panel, which is where in this kind of workforce ecosystem is a solution that we want to attract, right? There's a part of it that's for those that are out of school and out of work, right? And what does that look like? There are different solutions there, right? And I would say that for younger ones, right? There are different solutions for older workers, right? The incumbent workers who've been laid off because of COVID and need to come back, right? So there's a variety of different ones. So, but one thing I wanna say is CUNY right now, their transfer student population is almost larger than their first time freshman population. And if we're not intentional to encourage that we are counting on community colleges to do a big lift here, we're really missing the boat. So what does that look like? Intentional relationships with community colleges or by the junior year, intentional relationships with four-year colleges because they don't have the social capital to get those internships. And that's why we're seeing them leave, right? So there's a piece of this that is saying, what can we do? We could do something regarding transfer students and making sure that they have access to these employment opportunities, right? The second thing I think the city can do is continue to expand its summer youth employment program and include a more diverse set of employers, okay? I think that's important. The third thing is one in every six workers in this city is in the nonprofit sector. So when we act like it's just about the, the private sector, we're not looking at the nonprofit sector. And that requires a level of upskilling too. Many nonprofits right now are looking for people who are the equivalent of data scientists, right? How am I gonna understand this? Where's the tech going, right? So even that, what are the incentives and support that are happening for nonprofits that will be hiring via proximity these places? And in fact, many of those women who leave those companies will go to the nonprofits because that will be a more hospitable place for them, right? They'll earn less money but again, what does happiness mean, right? What does it mean to accept the whole person? There's things we could think about, right? And so I'm not, you know, this is, a, this is a, so I would say that. And then, the, then the, the last thing I would say that I think is really important is this piece that you brought up too. What does it mean to have quality in a particular credentialing program, right? There has to be some way that we can help get through the noise, right? The same way we, we were messed up with the noise of what's a quality higher ed institution that confused folks, we really need to get through the noise of what's a quality provider, right? Um, because that's gonna help people too. Because people are, are now wasting money to be in these programs and not getting something out of them, right? And they can become predatory tomorrow as well, right? So those would be the things I would offer. So just quickly in terms of, um, uh, since you and I keep mentioning CUNY. I just want to say one number. There are two numbers. Uh, there are between 15 and 20,000 students today studying computer science at CUNY. So we're not talking about a little population. The opportunity. And I'm there a proud is huge. CUNY graduate. Oh, yeah, let me make that clear. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Um, so, but in terms of the public sector, um, I think there's an opportunity for uh, um, the city government to provide various kinds of incentives, not to the Googles and Accentures who don't need them, but to the hundreds of other companies uh, in the city to create, I'll say all of the above, the micro internship opportunities, the apprenticeship opportunities, the skills-based training and so on, uh, to incent um, all of the companies to lean into this. Um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a tax incentive uh, or, or what, but, um, uh, uh, to, to, to raise the bar on what the company in the New York ecosystem is expected to do in order to lean into the talent pool that's sitting in our own backyard. I would just echo the, the point around the summer youth employment component there. Something that we've been doing at Google in Chicago is uh, the city of Chicago has provided substantial summer uh, youth employment funds, and so Google has partnered with Chicago Public Schools and several other nonprofits that enable other nonprofits and local community partners to place more students. And so that's something, that's a really important point about how 
the state and local governments can in, can create additional resources that allow industry to, to serve as hosts or to stand with local com, local community partners so that they can provide that substantive practical experience for students. The other thing I would call out, and I know this is something that's happening here in New York, is flexibility around the, the credentials for teachers, for example, so that we can get more highly qualified individuals that may not go through the traditional pipeline of getting the four-year degree, but but being flexible around that credential so we can get substantive practitioners in the classroom in front of students, exposing students and giving them the, the skill set that they need to ready them for tech and tech adjacent roles. That's great, thanks Janika. Janika, you wanna jump in? You can do it. I can, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess I won't go back to the, 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 the red uh, this, is, uh, this is, I'll just add some, uh, I guess aside, I don't know if it's controversial or not, but a little bit. <laughs> uh, so I think like, yeah, government does obviously play a really important role, right? And it's helping as a long-term perspective, hopefully, uh, help shape the systems in cities. Um, I think going back to like, and this is not just an employer, jobs, like the training has to work. So how to design the incentives to for make sure all these things are effective. Um, there's a lot of unknowns about how effective training is. That can be on the trainer, it can be on the employer, it's all difficult things. So, I think creating the right system around the data and the accountability is helpful. One way to do that, and you know, I'm a little biased because we do this at Pursuit, is creating um, income share systems that not only create sustainable financial mechanisms to scale training, but also has the data on accountability. And you can turn that into bonds. So think about how most public infrastructure is financed, it's through muni bonds, right? So, um, so how do we think about that instead of student loans where it's predatory, where you don't have any results? How can it be outcomes-based financing? I know that seems very simple, but, um, or might seem irrelevant this kind of conversation, but that then really has, um, builds trust among everyone, employers, students, um, everyone else, um, to make sure there are real long-term results for the employment and jobs. And also, the city plays a role in which it's not just purely expending revenue. I think the challenge with, you know, if there's when job training is needed most is during recessions. And that's the times in which city budgets cut back. So how do you think about those times in which you're able to do that? So I think thinking about these creative financing mechanisms is really important. The second point around the policy, I think, is around, um, you know, workforce development is so incredibly important, right? And, um, you know, as a kid from Queens also, and, and thinking about neighborhoods, like, workforce development, we're talking about why it's important, is a piece of a larger economic opportunity puzzle. So I think um, tying in this conversation we're talking about of jobs and employment to neighborhoods is critically important. Where people are living, yeah, um, are these opportunities available for the real estate and neighborhood development that is happening across the city? How can we? think about that being tied to workforce in thoughtful ways, because I think we all want to ensure that kids from every neighborhood can have access to jobs in their neighborhood. And so I don't think that should be disconnected. So I don't think, so I think that's a good role, and obviously there's huge power city has in that, versus a market making talent role, which I don't think the city or government should play in terms of that. Like it shouldn't be forcing employers to do these things. but. I think in the levers of economic development tied to neighborhood development, I think is incredibly important and something that a larger, like, can I from a neighborhood in New York understand that these jobs are for me? I, I think that, like, that, that being tied and seeing that kind of opportunity is, is just so critical and the city plays a role in that by where employers are. Well, thanks, Jika. We're going to keep this conversation going by turning it over to our amazing audience. So I'm going to give up my microphone, um, and, and if we could actually just get one more volunteer from the panel to share a mic, and, and we can uh, we can swap. And uh, we'd love to hear from all of you. I would just say, please, you know, let us know your name, title, or affiliation, where you're coming from when you answer your question. Keep it short if you can, so we can get to as many as possible. And uh, looking forward to everyone's questions and thoughts. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Greg Bethel. I'm the president of Pencil, one of the nonprofits here in, in New York City. Um, I thought it was interesting at the beginning that, Shanika, you talked about systems and ecosystems. And then, Stuart, when you were talking about the apprenticeship program, you talked about the hundreds of folks that are in it right now. One in 300 Americans goes to public school in New York City every day. That's a million kids. 65,000 should graduate every year. We are littered in that ecosystem with a range of programs that are all competing with each other 
trying to figure out what good looks like while there are thousands of kids in New York City looking for opportunities right now. Um, we are one of the providers for, for the city's uh, Ladders for Leaders program. Mayor Adams is talking about placing 100,000 students this summer in summer youth employment and a whole range of things from summer camps all the way up to professional internships. My organization is supposed to place 1,000 kids. We have 1,500 kids trained right now, ready for those professional internships, looking for the jobs and the access to good jobs in New York City that we're talking about here. I think we know what the answers are. I think we need to start looking at the practical opportunities to actually begin to connect kids earlier in the pipeline. And these are high school and college students, many of them at CUNY. So my question is really simple. Who's hiring for this summer for New York City kids so that we can help the mayor reach that goal and begin to open up that pipeline into the companies that are going to make the city successful? Well, I'll start. We accentuate we are hiring. I mean, we, we set a goal of hiring 20% of our incoming uh, class from, from the apprentice program. So we're, we're, we're definitely hiring. We're also part of a network. You're absolutely right. Hundreds is not enough. We're also part of a network. Of, of people who are working in apprentice programs to, to get to the point where we, we have over 10,000 apprentice roles um, across the network of people. We're also part of um, the 110 initiative where we have, an, you know, as in, you know, you're nodding, you know about 110. Our ambition there is to have uh, uh, over a million uh, black Americans who are in family sustaining uh, roles. So we, we, we are in lots of different, uh, in, in lots of different programs. And for sure, we could argue that, you know, how many, how many programs do we need? Well, you could argue we need more programs you know, like this. So I would say, yeah, we're hiring and uh, we, are, we are absolutely committed to getting those numbers up, which comes back to my point earlier. I was like, what, is, what should CEOs do? They need to sponsor, them, sponsor it. I, I missed out the other part of what the CEOs need to do. Uh, and it's part of is spending time with, with leaders like these on the stage who've got a, who've got a strong perspective. And whilst I don't necessarily agree with everything that Juke has been saying about, you know, I, I, you know, it, the absence of conflict is apathy, not consensus. And, and we, need, we need a bit of conflict. We need a bit of challenge. And so, you know, every time a CEO opens a door and listens to someone who's got a different perspective, it will grow their ability to do a better job. And so, um, you know, very simply, you asked a very direct question, are we hiring? The answer is yes. Uh, and, and do we have ambitions to get beyond the hundreds to get to the thousands? We, we'll, we've, we've done, we did 1,200 in total, but at 568 this year. So logarithmically, that curve is getting steeper. And we've said 40% of our roles, and of course, I think you have a, some sense of how many people we hire in, you know, we, we are in, in North America. We're tens of thousands of people, and we're saying half of our employees are going to be uh, non, the people without four-year degrees. So we, so we, I think, are all on a path. It's early, and the, um, the, the reality of you're, you're saying we need to move faster. I, I think that's where if I've been asked uh, the question about what, what, is, what does government need to do is we've come out of a pandemic where things that would take years to do, suddenly we found ways to do weeks. We talk about compressed transformation, which is about the speed at which you get stuff done. And, and the, the boards and the clients we have in the private sector are finding or asking this question, how can I do this not in three years, but in three months? How can I do this in three weeks, not three months? How can I do this in three days, not three weeks? And that compressed speed is really what you're asking, is why can't we do this faster? And I think that's, that's on, on every private company, but it's also on the public sector. Like, how do we move faster? And that, that, that is a absolutely critical question that we at Accenture are spending a lot of time with our clients and our partners with is moving faster. It's absolutely moving faster. Hi, uh, Leslie Abbey from Hot Bread Kitchen. Um, and we are doing a whole host of the things that were talked about here, um, but in the food industry. Um, and so I sort of wanted to just put out there that we are, you know, the, the kinds of things that you all are talking about need to expand beyond just the tech industry as well. Um, for those here uh, from Google, we are um, a strong partner of Google as well and have placed many women into the Google cafeterias. So we just want to thank, for, uh, thank Google for their partnership as well. Um, I, I, the, question, the last question you asked was what government can do. And I guess I put this out to the panel as well. 
Um, my answer to that is that what we're seeing um, with the women that we are working with in, in the food industry, in the culinary industry, is that they really do need support to actually be able to succeed in these companies. And so we are the nexus between kind of the women that are in the neighborhoods that you're talking about and the Googles, hopefully one day the Accentures as well. Um, but we need support. We need, we need to be there to recruit the women. We need to be there to train them. We also need to be supporting them after they're placed. Um, these kinds of sort of job placements and um, uh, moving through the ranks don't just happen on their own. And I don't think the employers themselves can do it um, on your own as well. So I guess my question is, you know, where is the commitment to supporting the nonprofits that are the nexus between the clients that we serve and the large companies, um, and that's what we're hoping to uh, to be. I'll, can I uh, start? And I'll be I'll be very quick. So, so I, I lead the northeast, and, and we have four common parts to every single agenda that we have. We ask, how are we creating value for our clients? How are we creating value for our people? How are we creating value for our partners? Google's a partner, by the way. And the most important question, and it forms part of every agenda, how are we creating value for our communities? And that means that, that Accenture people are out making a difference in their communities. And we, we spend a lot of time picking where we're going to invest that time. And of course, we invest millions of hours every year across the, 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 the country. As the Northeast lead, my goal is to make sure that the Northeast is the biggest contributor to community. And so if there are things we should be doing, I'd happily, you know, we'll, let's, get, let's get coffee and figure out what we can be doing to contribute to, to be part of, of your aspect of the community. It's, it's a consistent part of every agenda. Clients, people, partners, and community. And they hold the same importance in the narrative I have with my leaders. And if it's not like community is the one on the end, we often start with community. We often start with people. We often start, it's, it's not a, they're, they're equal, equal players in the importance of how we operate in Accenture. Yeah, a comment that I would also make is actually something that uh, Laura made, the comment that she made at the top of the, of, the, of the event, which is creating opportunity for incubation and bringing partners together and providing a place and space for local partners to have that conversation. And that's some of the things that Google tries to do, in particular like the Rouse Small Business Fund um, and some of the different lab, laboratory style kinds of gatherings that we, can, we provide where we just try to provide the place and space and bring representation from a range of sectors together so that you can share ideas, so that you can collectively figure out how do you support your local communities together. And I think that's another opportunity that Google or industry can play, which is really trying to provide the space, place, platform, and insights and expertise for the collective community. Um, and I think that's really important. And we've, found, we've seen great success there through things like the small um, small business fund and through entrepreneurship funds um, that we provided. Hi, uh, Liat Kravchik from the EDC. Um, formerly, I ran the Cyber NYC workforce programs. Uh, my question for, I have two questions. One is for Shanika, which is skill-based uh, talent signaling, of course, is the big question in the room, right, in terms of actually shifting away from uh, degrees in general. Is there any efforts to codify and achieve consensus around what that means for top jobs? And my question for Judy is, um, to what extent do you think your cohort, the group uh, portion of the spring turnships is the key to success? And where can we, where can we actually use more of that type of model elsewhere, for example, to retain more women uh, early on in tech uh, workforce? Yeah, so that's a great question, specifically around skill-based. Um, speaking as Shanika and some an expert in this space, not Google, um, there are a number of organizations, membership organizations, like ACM, uh, there's another one called the National Clearinghouse, Competency-Based Clearinghouse Organization, where we work with a number of membership organizations that actually do dig into this notion of skill-based learning, competency-based learning, so that we can clearly understand what are the skills, the requisite skills that specific profiles, and again, my lens is tech, um, but when you look at some of the work that's happened with ACM and this National Clearinghouse organization uh, that looks at labor market data, they work with organizations like Burning Glass Technologies, so we look at global data uh, that, um, where you start with the job posting, so a data scientist. Look at the job postings from all over the world. What are the skills that companies are calling out we then create a bit of a taxonomy around these profiles, these role profiles, and then by understanding what those requisite skills that we're seeing globally, we're able then to create a bit of a profile 
around the skills that are needed for specific jobs, entry level, mid level, advanced. And then we use that understanding as a means to help do a bit of this audit that Lizette mentioned, this equity audit around our hiring practices, around recruiting. So I think that's the work that needs to happen and those are the places and spaces that we turn as we try to build a, de a deeper understanding and capability around skills-based learning. Now, how do we change large scale systematically around removing or addressing the, the four-year college gate? That's a collective work that, happened, that, that we all need to happen, that has to happen, I think, if we could get a coalition of the willing at the industry level to collectively come together and have a conversation about how we examine credentials as the signal to readiness or preparedness for a specific career. That's a long game. But I will say I know, and we hear this in the commitment of Accenture, certainly at Google, these are the steps that we're taking. We're actively paying attention to the, to, to the skills side of, that, of the recruiting um, our recruiting practices. Something else to call out, and Accenture, has, Stuart has mentioned this in his comments, through our apprenticeship programs, which I will, I'm proud to say we don't fall in the class that UK <laughs> mentioned, kind of the spray on sticker, but really through a lot of these programs and our in-house training programs with tech talent, we really are intentionally looking at the profile of entry level, new grads, career switchers, so that we can clearly understand what are the skills and how are we conveying that back into the, into the job posting? And so that we're providing su substantive indication of the signals back to the talent of what we're looking for. And so if you go and look at a lot of Google job postings, we talk about things like the equivalent, right? Um, we're not there yet. We're, we're, we're really in trying to be more intentional but there's more work that has to be done. But those are some of the things that we're doing. Well, on that notion, there is definitely more work that has to be done. Um, and unfortunately, it'll have to happen outside of this panel discussion. We're out of time. You know, Leah and Judy, if you guys could connect afterwards, obviously, it's a great question. But we just have to turn it over to our very exciting uh, follow-up discussion. I'll turn it over to our executive director, Jonathan Bowles. And uh, thank you. Please join me in a round of applause for our amazing panelists. Um, we really appreciated your thoughts. All right. That was an amazing discussion. Thank you to our panelists, and thanks to Eli. Um, and uh, we've got a, another exciting part of today's event. Uh, and uh, if I could have uh, Deputy Mayor Torres Springer come up and join me. Hello. Yeah, it was, and thanks so much for being here and for being here for the whole panel and for taking it all in. I really appreciate that. Um, everyone, this is Maria Torres Springer. Uh, if you don't already know, and I'm sure you probably haven't been sitting under a rock, and you, you do know uh, Maria is the city's deputy mayor for economic and workforce development. Uh, I'm just going to give a little more of a brief introduction, and then, then we'll get into this. Um, so Maria previously served as vice president of US programs at the Ford Foundation. And before that, she led three different city agencies, EDC, SBS, and HPD. I'm pretty sure she's the only person in the city's history that can say that. Um, and I think it also means she brings a whole lot of expertise to this conversation and to the job she's doing as deputy mayor. Uh, among her many accomplishments in government, she launched the Tech Talent Pipeline and Women Entrepreneurs NYC. I think I first met you many years ago when you were spearheading an innovative program for immigrant entrepreneurs in city government. Uh, so anyway, uh, can I just get a, a round of applause for Deputy Mayor Torres Springer? So, um, so before I get into the question, I just want to say first of all that um, I think a lot of us uh, outside of government that follow these issues around education and workforce are just really encouraged and impressed so far with the steps you and this administration has taken. The fact that there is a deputy mayor who has workforce development in her title, uh, you know, some of the hires and, and Joey and Abby uh, on the great workforce team that has been brought in to uh, government uh, for the things that you've launched so far with the blueprint uh, and that are in the budget, I think really kind of setting the signal that workforce training and skills development and investing in people is a really big priority for this administration. So congratulations for all that. Um, you know, we're here today at an event called 
the role of employers in expanding access to good jobs. And I think, you know, the way I think about this is that, you know, at the Center for an Urban Future, like a lot of other great organizations in New York, we've been calling attention to what city government, what the public sector can do around workforce training, around creating a more equitable economy. But I think, you know, we also need our employers to step up. And, and I think that's what this discussion is. And, and I guess we heard some great suggestions in the panel, but I want to turn to you. Before I ask you about the city's role in all of this, what, what would you like to see from our employers? Do you think that we need more? Do we need more companies to step up? Is that working? Oh, much better. Okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? That was a great panel, and Juke always, he never disappoints. Where'd you go, Juke? Okay. Um, always, there you are, always provocative, but I totally agree that part of what we all need to do as a city, regardless of what sector you're in, is to have these types of productive conversations, healthy debate, not use the same playbook, interrogate assumptions about how we've all been working in order to accomplish goals. So thank you to Juke and the amazing panelists, and thanks for having me here today. Uh, before I get to employers, um, I do wanna say that I am so excited to be able to come back into government, and as you mentioned, Jonathan, to have um, in the title, but really more in of the DNA of the office and the work that I see ahead, uh, having economic and workforce development really is part of the remit. Not, one is not better than the other. In fact, they are one and the same. And so everyone in the economic and workforce development orbit, they know that they, are, they have to do both things. And we can only be successful if we tackle these challenges in tandem. And so excited, Abby Jo Siegel, who is here, who's part of the team, and Jose Ortiz Jr., um, individuals who have built really great programs, have worked very closely with employers. And so we're just getting started. I asked for a little bit of patience to be judged, not so much even by what's in our the economic blueprint that we put out several weeks ago, but the change that we're gonna make and what we're going to accomplish together with everyone in this room over the course of the next um, several months and years. And now to your question, absolutely, we have um, the major goal of the mayors, of course, and mine and everyone on the team, is to make sure that we are, in fact, connecting New Yorkers to quality jobs and to um, the types of skills training and opportunities that are needed. They've always been needed, but given what we're facing post-pandemic, extremely urgent. And so the blueprint laid out what those pillars are in terms of our work for economic, for workforce development, from reimagining the public workforce system, making investments in wraparound supports, in adult ed, in digital literacy, um, very importantly, thinking holistically about K through 16, through adult ed, and also focusing on worker protection. Now, we can't do any of that alone in government. We need the help and support and leadership of talent developers, service providers, not-for-profit, and of course, our employers. And what has been amazing to me and very encouraging to me in all of our conversations in the start of the administration is that there's a ton of energy to do more, to do better. And so what does that look like? Um, you know, of course, it means participating first and foremost this summer because it's a very real opportunity um, in programs like summer um, SYEP. And um, as was mentioned earlier, the goal is very aggressive this summer, 100,000 young people in our city. We want to make sure get connected to opportunities. But the, the, role, the, the role is also beyond that. It can be um, helping um, really be at the table as we in city government together with partners think about what it means to reimagine our system and being on the ground floor in terms of program design, program delivery, oversight, um, it also means being innovative and experimental. So much of what I loved about the discussion is that employers are stepping up and trying new things. And let me just be clear about why that's important. 
Because I think so much of this conversation centers around this skills gap narrative. And don't get me wrong, it's important to address the skills gap and whether that is a young person trying to enter the workforce or a mid-career person who just got displaced from his or her job and is and looking for a new opportunity. But the focus on that, that narrative also has a lot of deficiencies. And I think that's, I heard a, a lot of that during the panel discussion earlier. Because the, the conventional wisdom is a, a, a New Yorker is underemployed or unemployed in the this, in this city. And if we just train them, then the problems would go away, they'd be gainfully employed. We know that's not true. And if you focus just on the skills gap, what we all, I believe, um, fail to fully recognize is that there is a historic intergenerational set of barriers that are faced by New Yorkers people of color in particular, older people, people with disabilities, the justice involved, just to name a few. And so, in, in other words, there is a structural character to this problem. And the work of addressing the structural problem is certainly the work of government, it's also the work of, this, of civil society, and it's also the work of employers. And so that is, as we think about our work ahead, all of the programming, all of the funding, the in-kind services, the experimentation, all of that is great, but it also has to be a very sober and honest realization about what the true barriers are for New Yorkers to attain jobs. And the last thing that I'll say, I know I have a lot to cover, but this, this is, I'm, I'm so excited to be in this role, is that, you know, I hear stories about hi, how hiring really happens with companies. Like how it really happens. Like where those decisions are really made. Where the choices are actually made. What is an algorithm versus what is not. And what I like about choices is that we can unmake them. And so for the employers in the room or who are listening, I think our, our hope and aspiration is to work in partnership so that the choices that are made are ones that are not just a little bit more beneficial, but are drastically, dramatically more beneficial for New Yorkers who most need a leg up. Thank you. Um, you know, I think, you know, getting to some of the things that Juke was saying, you know, I, I really liked how Eli kind of pivoted from, from some of it to, to say that, you know, apprenticeships are, are one option for employers and, and we're kind of looking at how what's the role of employers in expanding access to good jobs and I think that's one legitimate one one that the Center for Inner Future has written a lot about and that we really are believers in but there's also paid internships which I think as Eli mentioned you know just the internships at CUNY are way too small for what we where we should be um, not even to say internships just for high school students or, or others in, in New York um, the opportunity to recruit from CUNY uh, for, 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 for jobs, uh, the opportunity to do mentoring programs, uh, to change your hiring and recruiting practices. Uh, there's a lot of different options, yet you know, it seems like there's, there's some great companies that are stepping up and we're here today at Accenture, they're doing amazing things. Google is doing amazing things. Uh, there's a lot of other companies, but it's still a relatively small number. And I guess, I'm, I guess my next question to you is, how do we change that? You know, there's great city government programs around the workforce and skills development, but what, what can you do or what do you ask of employers to really, you know, triple, quadruple the number of employers in New York that are stepping up with these pathway programs? No, I, I, the challenge as I've experienced it has always been one of scale and of what it means to drive true systems change. And so what we're doing, what we've done since the beginning of this administration is you know, make sure we all come, we've worked on these issues for, for many, many years, but to not pretend that we know what the contemporary questions and or um, uh, challenges are. And so I think it actually, it always starts with the type of deep listening with employers to get at the root of why isn't there more, why aren't those programs bigger, 
why aren't those programs more enduring? How do we bring more employers to the table? You know, Accenture and Google have been terrific partners to many in this room and to the city. How do we get more of you? And, and it's a, a big part of that, I think, is for government and for talent developers to be honest about why it's hard for employers to engage in these programs, right? So that those barriers run the gamut from is, do they actually see value in it? Is there wariness about working with government? I know everyone loves working with government, so that's a, a little bit of a, um, maybe that, that's not relevant, but um, wariness working with government or with not-for-profits. There's the cost and time and labor intensity of working with these programs. And so I think it starts there being, and having real conversations with employers about what is hard about doing this? That's number one. How can we address it? And, and also was discussed earlier, what does good look like? And that's a role where I think government can play a very, that's um, an important role for government because we, there is a proliferation of, ama of amazing workforce development programs. The ones that are government funded alone, and you know, Cuff has written about this, um, of course, over the years, there's scores of them. And we have to be clear as a city, in my opinion, about what good looks like so that we are better stewards of the public dollars used for workforce, but then we can also share those learnings with employers and we can build out um, a better ecosystem. The, you know, the third thing I think is we all together also need to be very focused on job quality. So a lot of what we talked about today, kind of employers, in-demand skills, high growth um, sectors, really important to create multiple pathways for New Yorkers into those jobs. And then there are employers in this city who we have to work with very, very intentionally to ensure that the quality of the jobs in those companies are dignified, are good, and and everyone, and that's everyone's work. The wor workforce development and worker protection, in my mind, are the same thing. Skills training is important and also a real understanding and support for what it means for New Yorkers to have dignified um, employment opportunities, um, also critically important. So our work is just beginning and mostly what I am really excited about is the invitation that we are really putting out to the world. I mean, for several years, a lot of ink was spilled, a lot of hand-wringing, given automation, what's the future of work? And now just as, just as much ink post-pandemic with um, remote work trends, what is the future of work? And I always hate that question. I think the real question, what is the future of our workers? How do we put the pe people back at the center of these discussions and then the change that we drive as the public sector, as the private sector, um, and of course the not-for-profit sector that's so vital to all of this work. You know, I appreciate you coming here fairly early in the administration, and I know as you're saying to be patient that you're putting together a lot of your programs, um, although some of it was outlined in the, the blueprint, some of it uh, we see in the budget that, w that was recently announced. Um, and I'm curious, of those things that you already have kind of put out there, like some of the things, the executive budget, for instance, you know, calls for, you know, training New Yorkers in some of the faster growing careers, including technology and healthcare. Um, have, have, have you started to think about how employers connect to those programs? Uh, any, any thoughts you can share um, about that? Yes, I'll mention two things. One is, um, the, a, a very concrete opportunity, which Juke mentioned, probably under underutilized, undertapped previously, the real connection between our work in sectors, growing particular sectors, and I'll mention a couple, or in real estate, neighborhood-based economic development, and, and workforce. So um, when you look at what the investments that we're making on the more traditional economic development side in the green economy, and in this example, you know, offshore wind, for instance, or in life sciences. So two sectors where we think there is, a, there's a lot of room to grow. We can be leaders here in New York City. And it's not enough to just think about 
where these companies are located, how many of them they are, and how they grow. We have to, from the ground floor, which we are doing, despite um, being the early days of the administration, making the types of connections that are needed so that New Yorkers, our young people, CUNY graduates, adults, can benefit from the jobs that we hope will come from those investments in those sectors. And um, at the same time, when we think about economic development projects across the city, my, um, uh, what I've been really excited about and heartened by are colleagues who understand that workforce development isn't just doing a job fair at some point during the land use process of a major project. Um, that was never acceptable, and I, 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 I'm not thinking about any particular project, but that is, um, there's just so much more that we can and should be doing to make those connections, and we're already starting that, and I think there's, there's much more in that arena. Um, but I think the larger opportunity for us is to redesign the entire system, and again, public sector, not-for-profit, employers, to really redesign it for equity. And what I mean here is that we really ask ourselves how the public system is performing for job seekers, and in particular those who most need our support, versus just tracking how participants are doing in training programs. And so that, that's, a, that's a shift that um, we need to make across the public workforce system, and it is a, an invitation as well that I put out for everyone who drives the system, major actors, including employers. If you are redesigning, let's be clear, you're hiring for equity because it makes both moral and business sense, how differently would you walk in the world? How differently would you partner with the not-for-profits in this room or government? What choices would you unmake? You know, I was speaking with somebody um, working for a corporation that does some of these issues around skills building and, and recruitment um, fairly recently, and I asked her, how, how could we affect change here in this, in this kind of space? And, and she said, it would be great if the mayor were to bring together a lot of employers and basically challenge them to like create a new career pathway program. Maybe modeled on some of the ones we heard today in the room, but, but really get them to follow it up. And kind of gets to your point that you made earlier around bring employers to the table. And I guess, you know, just pivoting on that example that I mentioned, you know, I mean, w is that something that you all are thinking about doing or that you, you, you've thought about already about bringing employers to the table? And we already have things like the Job CEO Council, which is a great example of that where companies got together and they made these commitments. But, you know, I'm curious, can we have a lot more companies and new companies do that kind of thing? Yes, the problem is Abby just started literally like seven days ago. Uh, four, four, four. No, um, so um, the answer is yes. And I think the challenge is, you know, for the employers in the room, you get invited to all of these task forces and round tables and working groups. So we have to be clear so that you come back to the second you know, round table meeting. What is it that we want to accomplish together? And I think it'll vary. I mean, we are, and we talked about it in the blueprint, there will be a larger future of workers task force that we are putting together. And, um, but we have to make sure that we're also being granular because so much of the great, not engagement, but partnership with employers, I found to be very sector-based. And so what does that mean for tech? What does that mean for green? What does it mean for life science? And how can and we in government have to be very clear about what we're asking for? What does success look like? What are we asking of employers? Um, and, and so you know, I think we've been clear with, with programs like um, SYEP for this summer, and we have someone in the mayor um, who understands how the public, private, not-for-profit have to work together and who is not bashful in asking um, for the type of support and partnership um, from employers. So we'll capitalize on, on all of that. We'll do it in a broad scale. We'll do it by sector. 
And um, for those in the room or employers listening who have been on um, your more than fair share of task forces, we also will ask pretty honestly from, from Jump, what does it mean for this to be a meaningful engagement for you? So I'm excited about all of that work. More to come. Great. I'm going to ask one more question, and then um, I'd like to hear if there are folks from the audience that have questions. But, um, you know, we heard a little bit about apprenticeships and paid internships. And I guess I wanted to ask you just kind of about both of those things. Um, you know, we heard earlier that, you know, there's a lot of great CUNY students out there. A very small percentage of them get internships. And as someone on the first panel said, this is really how a lot of people get experience, get, get hired. Um, I can tell you that two of our uh, six employees at the Center for an Urban Future were former interns. Um, we are really investing in bringing on more interns from CUNY because we see that's where we are hiring from. Um, but it seems like we have so much potential to expand those kind of paid internships. And I guess I'm curious, is there a role in the city in kind of encouraging more companies to take on paid interns, uh, to develop relationships with CUNY? Um, are there things that CUNY needs to do, in your opinion, to get there? And I guess related to that, I'm curious what, whether you have any thoughts about apprenticeships. Uh, uh, Accenture is doing some amazing things in really kind of bringing in apprenticeships, apprenticeships in uh, to, uh, to help diversify their workforce. Other companies are doing the same, but do you see an opportunity to scale that up as well? Yeah. Um, so a few ways of answering the question. Internships and apprenticeships, as you mentioned, there are many great examples, and I think our role in government is to um, identify which ones can be scaled, how they can impact positively more people who most need the, the um, leg up. So, um, you know, Jose and I have been talking, and, you know, he's mentioned a number of times that 90% of Fortune 500 companies, that 90% of the interns of Fortune 500 companies get offered an entry level position. And so it's a tried and true way to fill certain talent needs. Here's the, um, here's the challenge though, is that um, most of the interns, Fortune 500 companies come from the top 25 colleges and universities. So not a surprise, I'm sure, to anyone in this room and you know, those companies still have trouble filling their talent needs. So there's, a, there's an opportunity here, there's a gap here, and of course, CUNY is a major institution under tapped, and I am, um, um, have had a number of conversations and discussions and working sessions and additional funding to CUNY because I think that um, it, there is so much more as government that we can do. I'll also say, um, and just to share a little bit of a story, just, it was last week, the mayor called on a Zoom, everyone in the mayor's office who's hiring for an intern this summer, as we're all making decisions. And he was very clear about what the charge was. He said, I understand how everyone's looking at resumes, and we all know what it means to look at resumes for interns, and those, um, those aspects those that are markers of social capital and privilege versus real capacity was mentioned earlier. He was very clear that what he wanted us to do is think about who the intern was, whose life we can, who, we can actually change. The, the trajectory of a particular intern's life, if we invested and made that choice, we could actually change because that's what happened to him that is what he's seen time and time again with um, so many young people who um, given that opportunity. And so listen, I know that for employers in the room, it can't all be you know, uh, about uh, tugging at your heartstrings in an act of charity, but I am, this city is full of incredible, really incredible young people with extraordinary talent. And that is, that is really the invitation to think about whether it's an internship or an apprenticeship program, which for sure we want to see more. Um, really, it's uh, always been amazing to me how it's been around since the 30s, pervasive, globally, completely underused. 
um, in this country, in particular in New York, and good precedents with construction trains and unregistered apprentice uh, programs um, in tech. And so we want to see more and more of that. But I think there is the role that the, the, the enduring change that I see is not in the proliferation of many great programs, but in one, bringing to scale the ones that are really good, and two, in making sure that that scale in those programs actually benefit those who most need the support of um, government and of the employers of the city. Always been important, and as we try to come out of the pandemic, several hundred thousand still jobs short of our pre-pandemic levels with an, empl an employment level that it's, you know, almost twice the national um, rate and particularly high for black and brown New Yorkers. It is so crucial to be focused on all the issues we've talked about here today. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, are there questions from the audience? We've got one in the back. And then Judy has a question. Hi, my name is Christine Kovic. I'm co-founder of Harlem Biospace, a biotech incubator for early stage life science companies that I know, Maria, you're familiar with, and our K through 12 STEM initiative called Hypothekids. So we've been working on this notion of a diverse talent pipeline for New York City's life science, public health um, talent pipeline. Um, I wanted to, play off of actually something that was on the, um, the panel before this, talking about small businesses. So for us, we're sitting in a hub for small businesses. We see how fast they're going. And I think about how important internships are. And we place students at Harlem Biospace startups. But I wanted to emphasize that there needs to be a support mechanism behind that. So the Googles and the Accentures, there's, there's an inherent corporate infrastructure that can support interns. Um, whereas for, this, for small businesses, you have to rely on somebody, whether it's Hot Bread Kitchen, um, whether it's Pencil, somebody in, in, that is supporting, um, helping mentors be good mentors to interns. Um, and I also wanted to emphasize something on um, work that we were, were doing with um, Here to Here, which is I think these programs start at the high school level and it's, it's a building up of these internships um, that I hope Summer Youth Employment Program can start to address more. But um, I think it's a, a multi-year program that has to start earlier in high school so, so students aren't opting out even in their first year of college, but opting out before they even apply to some of these good jobs that are gonna be in New York City in the life science um, ecosystem. I appreciate those comments and just on, for small businesses in particular, um, I do think there is a lot more that we need to do to ensure that the workforce development services offered by the city are accessible to small businesses who, as you mentioned, may don't have the, the, the time or the infrastructure to necessarily participate. And then, And in that case, there is, and I think there already has been, but there's much more to nurture here, a really important role that intermediaries, um, whether um, you know, small I, from business improvement districts to um, community-based organizations who are really on the ground and understand the needs of small businesses can play um, as long as um, from the government perspective, we're clear about what, what those services could look like that would actually benefit small businesses looking to um, uh, hire and participate in programs. Judy? Thanks. <clears throat> Just good to go back to your commentary about uh, internships and uh, the program I discussed, we call it a sprint internship, but it's a micro internship. So why is it so successful? Uh, it's three weeks of an intensive experience for the company and the students uh, which lowers the barrier to entry. They're in and they're out. Any company can do it, and it's transformational on both sides. The cohort model is incredibly important because it's easier for the companies to host five sprinterns who work as a group than one. Uh, all boats rise, they help each other, and so on and so forth. So uh, 
the question or the, uh, the challenge I uh, offer is that um, in New York, uh, we typically uh, can place about 200 or so sprint turns, and we get over 1,000 applications. The limit is the number of companies that we can recruit from a manpower perspective, onboard them, and so forth. So it would be amazing to have a partner in the mayor's yes. office. Yes, you and I are clearly going to hang out soon. Um, right? And the companies pay these sprint yeah. turns. I actually think that's an important part to have some skin in the game. Uh, but it's just legwork and muscle to get them in and to match them up. But the demand is there and the transformational change lives uh, results are uh, clear. That's amazing. Thank you. Shanika? Thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, I was thinking about channeling Juke with something and being a provocateur, but I won't, specific to the comment around the structural barriers and challenges that exist. Um, so I'll go on, on a different point that you mentioned, which is this notion of scale. And so when we think about, in particular with the equity lens, one of the things that we know, in particular in my work at Google and, and elsewhere, is when we think scale, many of the programs that, and research bears this out, that actually has the sustaining, enduring impact for talent of, uh, that represent underrepresented groups, it's high touch, it's expensive, it takes time. And so I'm curious thoughts around when you say scale, what is the charge you would say to the ecosystem? What do you mean by scale? It, and, and it's just not numbers. In particular, when we're balancing the tension around time, talent, uh, high touch, and um, the fact that it's high intensive for, this, for these groups. So I'm just curious your thoughts. Um, two, two ways um, I, that I think about something that might be relevant to this discussion. One is, um, is it's really a charge for the government as we think about the many programs um, that we, we fund, how do we make sure that we are um, uh, supporting those that are most effective for the populations and communities that most need our assistance and scaling those. And for employers, I'd say a couple of things. I'd say, what does it mean and, and is it happening that what you are learning from the internship program, the apprentice program, is that getting translated to for lack of a better term, your basic core hiring. Because, of course, it's great if that in internship program quadruples in the following year or the apprenticeship program quadruples in the following year. But if the, um, if the learnings from that are stay within those who are supporting and running and championing those internship programs and apprenticeship programs, but then the real heavy duty hiring in your company is still following a very different set of processes and algorithms, then that's a different scale problem that I would just, I would, um, is another challenge for employers in the city and really, um, and also kind of in this country. And, um, and the second thing is, and, and for, for then those programs that are great, that can be scaled, it's, let's, let's be honest about what all of our roles can be um, in, in supporting that. If the challenge is uh, really better understanding what's good, you know, government of course can play a, 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 um, an important role in research and in data. If it is about finding the right partners, pipelines, feeders into the system, we can do that too. And so the challenge for scale isn't just good luck, you go do it, it's let's, let's engage one another because as we all know, this is an ecosystem of a lot of people who are well-intentioned, trying to do the right thing, that you are here in this discussion. You know, you, it means that you have a leg up on so many employers um, in the city because you care about these issues. How do we bring more in? So that's the third part of scale. How do we bring in um, more um, um, fellow travelers into this work? And, um, and, if we, and if we cover those aspects of, uh, of scale, I think we will we'll be doing more than just making an 
incremental dent, dent in um, the opportunity gap in this city. Well said. Well, uh, we're going to end there, uh, but uh, can everybody join me in, in giving a big hand to Deputy Mayor? It was great talking with you, Maria. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all. I want to uh, give another shout out to Accenture for hosting us today uh, and all the great work they're doing, uh, to Google for their really great support for today's event, uh, and, uh, and for all of you for joining us this morning. So thanks again, and have a great day.